Sankuma finished, the special prosecutor who said to me, it's now your time, go and fire. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm firing, blame him. <laughs> I know the vote of towns will come, but I'm humbled by the presence of His Excellency the Vice President and also the Chairman taking time off their busy shadows to be here. And I think we are making history. This is historic, and I think it is a good event for all of us to celebrate. Historic again because this is a unanimous decision granted by seven judges, and, and they didn't even disallow some of the reliefs. They granted all the reliefs against the Auditor General. At least they could have said we will console you a bit by <laughs> stopping this one. They said no way. And strangely, the, gay, the person against the reliefs who were granted was the happiest person. I actually said to Occupy Ghana that if the case had gone other way around, I would have appealed on your behalf. <laughs> because I don't think they could do otherwise. It's also a, a historic uh, moment for us because it has shown what collaboration can do to live, save our country. And the power does not reside only in public servants. In fact, I normally get confused when I'm hearing the word public servants. I don't know whether they're the people who serve the public or the public serves. When I say public servant, your excellency, do you understand? <laughs> I don't know whether they serve the public or the public serves them. But whatever it is, they are there for the public. And they must do what the public want, not what they want. That's the problem in Ghana. People come to office and they tell you, uh, we have, in fact, somebody came to me and said, you to me, I was <laughs> You are speaking with power. You are talking about law. And I say, wow, so where did you get your power from? <laughs> he said, you will know later. <laughs> so we, as a group of people or Ghanaians, have to come together. And let me also say it's historic because uh, the judgment delivered on the 14th of June 2017 has become an international reference material. I was in Fiji two months ago with Auditors General, and they had very interesting comments about Ghana. The Auditors General, when I say Auditors General, that's the correct word. We don't say Auditor Generals. It's Auditors General. We don't have Prof General, so Auditors General. So the Auditors General said for the first time, they came across a judgment which they can read and understand. Where were your, your judges trained? <laughs> Because they say normally when you get a judgment, <laughs> you need a lawyer to tell you that this is what they meant. But this one, when you read it, you can get it. So they said they were going to recommend to their judges to come to Ghana and learn how to write judgments, <laughs> which is user-friendly, <laughs> so people can. But more importantly, the decisions taken by the Supreme Court in that judgment has become the reference point for many in Africa and beyond. Let me say that I think Ghana is the country with the provision for disallowance and surcharge, the oldest. 1992, it was in our constitution. But earlier, the 79 constitution even had it. And the 69 constitution. So it's an old provision. I don't know where Ghana got that from. But following what has happened in Ghana, many countries have started following our example. As we speak today, Liberia has passed a similar law. Sierra Leone has passed it. Zambia passed it. And South Africa this year was the, the, the last one to join in passing a similar law. Because the Auditor General has now woken to the fact that they have a duty to protect the public purse, not just to report to the people how the public purse is being raped. In fact, in the words of the South African Auditor General, he said, I feel I'm operating at a journalistic level. I must go beyond that. <laughs> so he took the Ghanaian constitution 
ensure it to the South African Parliament and say, this is in the Constitution of Ghana. Why won't you put it into my heart? And unanimously, they passed it. So he sent me a test from Parliament. Daniel, you should hear this. The Parliament was unanimous in giving me your power. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, February this year, the president also gave assent to it. So it has become law in South Africa. So we are leading the way for this type of accountability and transparency to happen. Your Excellency, I came back from Egypt yesterday. I was in a, what they refer to as the first Africa anti-corruption forum. They made a mistake to make me one of the speakers. <laughs> and I didn't waste time to tell them what we are as Africans. We copy all the things and paste it wrongly. We pay lip service. And being an accountant, I told them, we believe in form than substance. In accounting, substance over form. But what do we do in Africa? It's form instead of substance. Yes, let's establish a judicial system, we establish it, and then we under-resource them. Even book to write on becomes a problem. I'm sure the police may say the same. At times you go and they want to help you, but they are helpless. He himself needs help as a policeman. <laughs> so how does he help you? We set up the institution and all the structures, beautiful, but we under-resource them, make them important. Then again, we have the audacity to go public and say, our police are not doing well. Our judiciary are not doing well. But we've forgotten that we've made them important. So I said yes, uh, two days ago at that forum that we need to fight corruption, not because fighting corruption is an easy thing. I actually say that fighting corruption is dangerous. Fighting corruption, anybody who fights corruption is exposing himself to danger, is that not it? And corruption will fight you back any day, in whatever form it can. So that's why many people, is, if they will not like to fight corruption, because they don't want the fight that corruption can bring to them. But it is more dangerous not to fight corruption, because it will finish us. So when you weigh what happens if we don't fight corruption, as against our fight against the corruption, I think, we have to fight corruption. <clears throat> Your Excellency, uh, when you were reading my lesson, they said I was in Zimbabwe. I'm sure you are my witness. We were in Zimbabwe together. He was leading African Development Bank when I was in the World Bank in Zimbabwe. And our offices were not too far away. When I was appointed in 2016, it did not lose on me at all that I was going into the lion's den. But I remember that I'm Daniel, so I say I'll survive. <laughs> because I knew that given my nature and character, it was going to be very difficult sitting there as Auditor General and not doing anything about it. I will do something. And when you do something, they will also do something to you. But I said, I will go. And here we are. I must say that it has been a collaboration, and I love it a lot. First, the legislature has been very supportive in approving budgetary allocation to the Ghana Audit Service, amounts which are about threefold what it was before I came to office. The executive has been very supporting, and I said it in uh, Egypt. I said, the problem about Africa is that we set up all these structures and we don't fund them. But in Ghana, I've received not everything that I wanted, but a substantial increase in support. So if we are doing something which you people say you've heard from Ghana, it's because the government is resourcing me. So when you go back, resource your agencies that are fighting corruption. Don't just go and establish them. Fanfare. And that's the end. So 
I must say the executive has played its part. I hope you are aware when there was a change in government, the first, one of the first announcements we had was a ban in procurement of vehicles. Is that not it? But this was the time that government gave us the permission to buy 34 vehicles to support the audit service. We have never bought 10 vehicles in the history of the audit service before. <laughs> but this permission was granted. Up to today, some are struggling with financial clearance to recruit staff. But government gave us the permission on two occasions. As of today, we have recruited from 2017 to date more than 400 additional staff to support us to do our work. <laughs> that is a practical way of fighting corruption. It's not by the slogans. I'm not saying the slogans are not good. They are good. But after the slogan, it must be supported by systems and actions that we require to go. As for the judiciary, I cannot thank you enough. Because now, if I'm disallowing and say charging, I can only blame you. That the Supreme Court says, I should go, and I'm going. Because A's have made me to know that I'll be in contempt, and I don't want to be, ever be in contempt of the Supreme Court. So that's why I keep pushing. But, Mr. Chairman, when you go back, my thanks to the Chief Justice. She has been very cooperative by dedicating only four courts where you can appeal against my disallowance and say charge. Otherwise, it will be a disaster for me. Assuming there's an appeal in Tamil and then one in Sunyani and one in Ho and one in Accra, one in, I don't know how we would have handled it. So when I had discussion with her, she said, request and I'll dedicate an, a, just a limited number of courts where your appeals can be heard. And that has made the work easier for my legal team. So this is a very good collaboration. The collaboration goes beyond that. The civil society, including Occupy Ghana and others, but I don't know why you have remained Occupy Ghana up to this time. You should become Occupy Africa. <laughs> Go beyond Ghana. <laughs> so think about the next stage. You say you were occupying Castle, what is Flastaff House and became Ghana. Now Africa. <laughs> Occupy Ghana, we cannot thank you enough because they have true a challenge to us, and that is why we have done what we have done. Let me say, the public at large has been very supportive, to be very honest with you. I've done several special audits based upon tip-offs from the public. They tell me, this institution, this is what is happening. And I'm very happy receiving those information. I tell people, if you like, don't give me your name. Just let the information reach me. And some of them, I send my team there to do a verification, and they tell me, sir, it seems what the people said is true. So let's go deeper. And so by the end of the year, sorry, the end of the month, you will see the report on special audits, and you see how the looting is continuing. The cow is still fat. And people are taking their share of it. But we will not stop there. Permit me to acknowledge my staff. Please, Ghana Audit Service staff who are here, please, can you get up? <laughs> Thank you very much. You can sit down. Very committed and dedicated public servants. People don't believe that these ladies and gentlemen were in the public service before I came. In fact, I was on a program in IEA and they asked me, where did you get the money to recruit these committed auditors into the public service? And I said, hey, they are all older than me. <laughs> Is there anybody who uh, I recruited before starting this? All of them, how many? They are all, if you ask them 30 years, 25 years, MBAs. <laughs> they are all MBAs. <laughs> They are all MBAs. But they've been behind me to do this over the years, and I cannot thank them enough. <laughs> Mr. Chairman and Your Excellency, I want to explain something for the benefit of the public. When we issue audit report or disallowance and surcharge, it's a long process. First, we even inform you that we are coming. Then there is what we call the entrance conference, where we tell you the objective, what we are looking for. 
the scope and the duration. In the course of the execution, we may find something which is not right. Normally we ask you, where is it? This payment voucher, there's nothing attached to it. Where is it? Where are the supporting documents? If you brought it, that ended the case. But if you don't bring it, then you will request for it, officially in writing, what we call request for information. And we normally give you a day or two to produce it. If you don't, then we turn now into a written audit observation. And in line with Regulation 34 of the Audit Service Regulation, we give you two, three, or five days because the regulation says we should receive those responses before leaving the audit location. So we give you that information. But if at the end of the day, observations remain unanswered or not satisfactorily answered, we issue what we call management letter. And before leaving the site, we will have drafted the management letter and discussed with you at the exit conference to say, when we came in, we raised 20 issues. You answered 12, fantastic. But eight of them are still outstanding. So we are waiting for your response because after two weeks, according to the audit service regulation, we will issue the final management letter. So after two weeks, if we don't hear from you or we hear from you unsatisfactory, we will issue the management letter. And in line with Section 29 of the Audit Service Act, give you 30 days, 30 good days. After all this, 30 days, please respond with sufficient evidence. Your Excellency, the disturbing part of it is that some of the MDAs, they will not respond. It's not only Auditor General who doesn't respond. We learned it from our clients. They will not respond. But that culture of impunity is gone. Because I've instructed my people, once we don't respond, we will activate section 29, subsection 2, which says that your salary should be stopped for as long as you have not responded. And we are going to do that. Because being a public servant, you must be accountable for your stewardship. So when there are questions about your stewardship, you must respond. If we are wrong, just prove us wrong to say, look, auditors, you got it wrong. Here's the evidence, full stop. So it is after that, before the audit report is prepared and sent to parliament. Then we go further and decide that since an issue or two have not been well addressed, we will disallow and surcharge, depend upon the status. If you have not yet paid, you only disallow. But if you are paid, then you have to surcharge. Even that, Mr. Chair, we give notice of intention to disallow and surcharge. Because we know when we are doing the audit, they don't take it serious. So when we reach a decision that we want to disallow and surcharge, we still give a notice to say, look, you have two weeks, now we are going to disallow the expenditure and surcharge. So come clear. Even that, they don't mind you. Then comes the certificate. So I just want to bring this to the notice of the public that our reporting is a bit different from what the journalists will be doing today. From here, they will issue their report. Is that not it? But ours, it goes through several processes, giving you the opportunity to do the best in responding to the issues raised. Let me say that in addition to that responsibility is one other responsibility, which I was surprised Mr. Rant didn't talk about. Declaration of assets and liabilities. Under Article 286 of the Constitution, the president, the vice president, the members of parliament, some senior officers, up to a director level in the civil service or people whose salary are equal to that of a director are supposed to declare their assets and liabilities before assuming office. And every four years, you declare. And the day you are going home, you declare again. The question is how many people have declared. If you have not declared and you are here, no problem, don't declare. But we are coming. We will get you. Because 
I've just given instruction to my team that we do a countrywide survey, institution by institution. It is, people here assess a liabilities declaration and they say, oh, for politicians. <laughs> the one vice president, has he declared? The one who is questioning is supposed to declare. <laughs> I remember we were having a discussion, one colleague of mine uh, who works in one of the government uh, establishments, uh, a state enterprise, and he told me that, Daniel, this asset declaration is good so that we will know the monies that they have stolen, as and I asked, have you declared yourself? He said, but it's not for us. <laughs> so I pulled out at 550 and read it to him. He said, oh, then this law is too broad. <laughs> so when it comes to accountability, it is for others. It's not for, <laughs> it's not for me. So please, we are going to come there and see what we can do. As a service also, we have introduced, I hope you heard it, we started a payroll audit. We are committed to removing all the people who are unlawfully on the payroll. We have just finished the audit and we have issued a management letter waiting for the MDS to respond, to explain to us why those people were on their payroll. And after we have done that, we will go ahead, disallow and surcharge. In fact, if you are head of a government department and you have ghosts on your payroll, we are not going to just take the ghosts. We collect all the money from you. Because under Regulation 297, the Financial Administration Regulation, you have a duty to ensure that the people paid on your payroll are people working for you. So if you fail in that duty, we are not going to look for the ghost. We take the money from you and you're going to look for the ghost. So it will come out very soon. We have also done or started procurement audit, and the results will be very beautiful when the, it comes out. And <clears throat> the least I talk about on the procurement audit, the better. Let me leave it there. I don't want to whet your appetite too much. Your Excellency, you might have seen some of the people on road doing infrastructure audits. I've commissioned my team to go on the road. I think the contractors have cheated us for too long. We will not do only paper review. Now we go on the road, and with the coin machine, we take a cylinder sample of the road, pull the bitumen out, and when we measure, we give you the tape to also measure whether you could get the 11 inches, which is in the bill of quantity. Because we cannot get it, so we normally give it to you, say, uh, measure and show us how you got your 11 inches because we, we cannot get it. And the first question I got is, do you have the competence of doing that? I say, yes, we are more than competent to do that. People don't know that audit service, we have about 50 other professionals who are not accountants. They belong to the College of Engineers, they are architects, they are surveyors. My friend sitting there is not an accountant, but he's an assistant auditor general. And he's a licensed surveyor. So he can go down the drains with you. <laughs> and I think we have to explore all this to protect the public purse. Don't, doesn't it hurt you when you are driving to work and you enter port hole? And at times the road has been constructed three months or barely one year, and it is like hell. Anytime I travel with my deputies, I disturb them a lot. When we land outside the country, I ask them, are you seeing the road? They say, yes. <laughs> I say, why can't we have that in Ghana? And Your Excellency, the disturbing part of it is that you compare notes with your colleague, auditors general, and you realize the cost of construction even in Ghana is higher than those good roads. So you ask yourself, what is wrong with us? After we have done all this, we turn around and we look to uh, His Excellency, the President, and the Vice to fix all our problems. <laughs> I'm sure they are magic people, so they have magic one. I'm, I'm saying that it's disturbing that we don't realize there is a collective effort of ours as Ghanaians. Yes, our police are not making the country safe. What have we contributed? Are they God? Please, can you answer me? Are you God? They are not God. They can't be everywhere. We all know the criminals. We will not expose them. 
We will not give any tip off. And then we want the criminals to be arrested. So it is time for change, I think, in our attitude, so to get Ghana to a better place that we want it to be. When it comes to the topic of today, which is moving from searcher to safeguarding, I cannot agree more with my colleague, Mr. Is Usu uh, Ankuma. So I don't normally want to give you Usu Is Ankuma because of Papa Usu Ankuma. He's older than you, so his name overrides yours. No problem. <laughs> Great. I must say that it comes from the old saying, prevention is better than cure. Is that not it? When it comes to corruption and crime, it's better to prevent. It's easier to prevent than the cure, because after, especially corruption. After they have benefited from corruption, they become very sophisticated. In fact, they can hide the best lawyers in town and at times even hire the judges. Uh, I don't know if they are available for hiring. <laughs> I'm not saying they hire you. I say in case they are available for hiring, they may hire them. They can do anything. But then when you are putting controls in place, to prevent the abuse, that time they have not touched anything. So even they themselves are even cooperative. So I'm very happy that His Excellency has hammered on measures we are putting in place to take advantage of technology. In fact, I was talking to some of my colleagues about a month ago, and I said, Ghanaians have been very patient with us, Accountant General and Auditor General. Is Accountant General here? I saw, okay, there's a deputy accountant general over there. And say, so given today's day and age, after the end of financial year, we still wait for six months before our report goes to parliament. Accountant general cannot produce accounts within a week. I think it's not acceptable. Your Excellency, we may have to transform them, <laughs> including us. We have to look at the process. I would like to ask you, if you had invested 10 billion in an enterprise, six months after the end of the financial year, you don't know your position. Will you be comfortable? Look at the budget, the amount spent per annum, and the year ends. And it's, as of today, we have not yet reported to parliament how's the money, how, much, how the money has been used. So we have to automate. So, Your Excellency, I want to say that the automation, you forgot to mention that of the audit service. We are also automating. We are putting in place audit management information system, where we can have online access to the systems that are being used. So when you pay, we know. If we see yellow or red flag, we follow. So it can be spontaneous, said so that the protection of the public purse can be done and done very well. Your Excellency, there is one thing very dear to my heart if we're talking about safeguard or putting systems in place and I would like to bring it to the fore. We have a very weak internal audit in the public sector. We have to have a second look at the internal audit. The internal auditors per the Internal Audit Act and the PFM Act belong to the various spending officers who are at the forefront of doing the wrong thing in the first place. So how do I employ you, do the wrong thing, and allow you to be telling me that I'm doing the wrong thing? We say I didn't know what I'm doing. So the internal auditors have become helpless. Not that they are not capable of doing what they should do, but their independence have been compromised unduly. I keep arguing that, look, take an auditor's independence away, and he's as useless as a paper or anything. The most important thing about an auditor is his independence. That's why I protect mine with my life. I say, I prefer dying than you taking my independence away. I will not give you my independence. It doesn't matter who. Yes, if you want to take it, I'll give you your job. <laughs> I'm not going to succumb to that. So the independence is very important. Let's look at the internal audit again. I have suggested, and I'll keep suggesting, that it's time we take the internal auditors away from the MDAs and put them in a central pool under the internal audit agency. In fact, even in the private sector today, internal auditors are being our source to avoid manipulation and control. Internal auditors in the corporate world, if you ask Pricewaterhouse, Ensign Young, etc., they do a lot of internal auditing for corporate world because the shareholders are afraid that management may manipulate them. 
So it's good we put them under the agency so that they are independent and then their professional development can be taken care of. Somebody is there to see, are you using standard? Or you are just doing anything at all? In that case, we can prevent the leakage before it happens because they are on the spot. We come like uh, those guys who take care of the dead bodies. We perform autopsy. When you come, we only tell you how he died. <laughs> but he will have died anyway. But we, I think we need physicians to keep the system alive. Is that not it? So, Your Excellency, if we can give it a consideration. I remember last year in the midterm review, the Minister of Finance mentioned it, that it will be looked at. If we can look at it with agency, it will be good. So that we take care of their welfare as well. Some of them are not well treated. In fact, almost every week, I get internal auditors trooping to my office. They want to join audit service. And when you ask them why, first I thought they would say, our salaries are not good. They say, no, we suffer professional abuse. Because you've done the professional work, you submit the report, and you are told on the face that we thought you belonged to us. You belong somewhere, right? You write this report, and you want it to be on record? OK, anyway, your colleague who is in Bulga wants to come to Accra. <laughs> Therefore, you can consider whether you will remain here <laughs> or you go to Bulga. Then the non-natural answer is, say, I will submit a revised version. <laughs> and everything disappears. I've been encouraging them that when they submit their revised version, they should still forward the original version to me, even without their name, so that I know what is happening over there. But we need to have a second look at it. Because personally, I think the Director General of Internal Audit should be part of the economic management team or the management team at the Ministry of Finance advising him on weekly basis that there's leakage here, there is this here. So when you go to cabinet, tell your excellency that this, your minister or ministry is being wasteful, or there is a lot of money there, they have not spent it and they want more. So let it go somewhere else. I think internal audit is the eye and the ear of management and we must use it effectively in Ghana. I would not like to keep you here, your excellency, for a very long time. Therefore, I would like to say that going forward, I think we must continue to collaborate the way we have done. And I'm so excited that we can say that we are organizing a program together, public sector and private sector. This is the true spirit of public-private partnership. And I cannot help than to say it's a good development. I have one suggestion, then I will not go further. In our fight against corruption, I'm also suggesting that if it is possible, we should not only decentralize the prosecution of corruption to special prosecutor, we should commercialize it, say so that individuals should be able to go and prosecute and then the reward should be good. In that case, I'm sure some young accountants and lawyers can come together and say, as for this case, you allow it to go. Because if we get 20% of it, our economy recovery program will have been successful. <laughs> is that not it? Yes. So we should look at it. Because if we are losing 100%, what is wrong? We will be making a law to say, look, if you save us the money which has gone, we will give 20% to you. And if we do that at a country, at least we'll be able to bring back this money. And of course, it means the prosecution will not be at the whims and caprices of one individual or institution. If they refuse to go, A's can go. If because he's, he has become a friend, he will not go, you can go. And that is the only way that I think we should protect the public purse and make it safe. I would like to assure that Ghana Audit Service, under my leadership, will remain committed to protecting the public purse, and we will do whatever it is in our capacity to continue doing. We call on the society, we call on Ghanaians to support us in protecting the public purse. Thank you very much. <clears throat>